Okay, so let's look at another uh, solution that comes out of uh, using simple equations uh, as balances uh, and looking at wind-driven response in the ocean. But first, let's conclude the Ekman transports and wind forcing. Obviously, if you have del tau x, del x greater than zero, so wind stress is uh, southerly here, northerly here. This is the x direction, so going from negative to positive. So the x uh, zonal derivative of meridional winds is positive, so that will produce uh, a Ekman divergence near the surface, which means the vertical transport will be uh, Ekman suction, so it will be in the positive direction. You can also do it as wind stress curl here and get uh, the thumb going out of the page. And similarly, if del tau x del y is less than zero, so let's say we have westerly winds here and easterly winds here, so again, wind stress curl is positive, which means uh, the uh, Ekman suction and Ekman uh, velocity are upward and there is a divergence in the meridional direction here. So in the uh, subtropical gyre, basically we will see uh, del tau x, del y, and del tau y, del tau y, del x together uh, creating a uh, anticyclonic circulation. But here, if we put these together, you get divergence out of this uh, gyre, like a subpolar gyre, for example, and there'll be Ekman suction. So Ekman pumping is when velocity is, uh, Ekman velocity is downward and converging flow. Ekman suction is when it's upward and you have a divergence uh, happening. And this can be obviously seen uh, along the coast. This is in the Northern Hemisphere, Northeastern Pacific, showing the curl of tau, which is positive here. Uh, you can see the uh, northerly winds uh, becoming uh, uh, weaker as you go towards the coast, so you have a curl that's a positive again, and corresponding to that, you can do in many ways, but you can look at the curl, or you can say winds are pushing the water southward in the northern hemisphere, you get the Coriolis pushing it to the right of the direction of motion, so away from the coast, which means there will be upwelling cold water has to come up and usually when cold waters come up uh, nutrients are brought up there is enough light so you have chlorophyll bloom so this is uh, uh, log base 10 of chlorophyll uh, let's say from a satellite or from uh, yeah this is from Modis Aqua so you can see high chlorophyll near the uh, coast where the strong upwelling is and then chlorophyll falls off as you go away from uh, the coast. So these are real examples of what happens, but you can see another schematic illustration of wind-driven upwelling along the coast of Antarctica in the southern hemisphere and along the equator here. So in, the, in both cases there is a meridional divergence of meridional Ekman transport, so you have uh, Tau x, you have westerlies, so in the southern hemisphere, y is in the negative direction, so tau x uh, is a positive, it's going from west to east, uh, so it's uh, if you are looking uh, in the western direction, uh, you have the arrowhead towards you, so wind coming towards you, and the uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the uh, wind uh, driven circulation or Ekman transport is away from the coast in the southern hemisphere uh, remembering that you are pushing to the left of the wind which requires Ekman suction or upwelling and that convergence uh, divergence pattern is also seen near the equator where you have um, Easterlies, uh, northeasterly and southeasterly trades, creating Ekman divergence on the equator. So, if you remember, uh, tau over f uh, is Ekman velocity is not uh, defined on the equator, but the dynamic Ekman divergence can give you uh, vertical Ekman suction uh, at the equator as well as we have seen already in terms of the upwelling in the eastern Atlantic and eastern Pacific oceans, uh, where the trade winds create. Ekman divergence and you can see what happens to the thermocline so you have convergence from the southern ocean and the equatorial region creating downwelling and uh, pushing the thermocline down whereas here the thermocline is 
pulled up. You can pull these ideas together for a uh, schematic illustration of the mechanisms involved in wind forcing of the subtropical ocean gyres in the northern hemisphere. So let's say you start with uh, flat isotherms and wind is going uh, uh, away from you so you see the tail coming towards you so you see the arrowhead and you are creating let's say uh, northeasterly trades in low latitudes and mid latitude westerlies here so you have the Hadley cell uh, being shown here as a poleward and equatorward uh, circulation uh, uh, happening and curl of the wind stress is negative so you can put your fingers around the trade winds and the westerlies and the thumb is pointing into the screen so that's negative because Z is upward out of the ocean when the thumb points downward it's uh, negative in the negative z direction so you can use your Coriolis uh, if winds are pushing the water this way rightward deflection rightward deflection rightward deflection and so on and you have convergence into the middle so Ekman uh, pumping which means W Ekman is downward so you obviously uh, have a high sea level and high pressure in the middle the subtropical gyre so you can see that the the convergence pushes the thermocline down with Ekman pumping we went from flat uh, isotherms to uh, sinking isotherms deepening thermocline corresponding to that you can think of warm waters accumulating in the center and warm waters occupy higher volume so the sea level goes up uh, there are many ways to explain it but this is a simple way to think about it and what should happen uh, once you have sea level uh, slope like this you know that there's going to be flow down the hill by gravity so you're going to have uh, Coriolis deflection happening so if flow is going towards the east coming towards you so you have the arrowhead here so the geostrophic current where the pressure gradient of the sea surface slope sea surface, sea surface height gradient is going to be balanced by Coriolis so you have geostrophic coming at you and geostrophic going away from you so wind driven uh, Ekman pumping is creating uh, sh uh, the uh, trough in the thermocline creating a, uh, a ridge in the sea surface height and the pressure gradient and giving you a uh, geostrophic flow so you can see uh, the flow here uh, driven by the wind so blue are the winds and red are uh, the uh, dashed reds are thermocline, uh, solid reds are sea surface height and uh, this is the sea surface height here and so on and so forth. So we'll come back and see how this works. So look at this interesting thing. Winds and the friction are generating uh, the gyre and the convergence and the Ekman pumping but the doming of the sea surface height then gives us geostrophic flow. Remember geostrophy is balance of pressure gradient and Coriolis so there is no friction there but here friction of the wind stress is creating a geostrophic flow down the sea surface height. What do we do with this? Uh, Harold Swerdrup in 1947 took the simple balance equations of uh, pressure gradient Coriolis and wind stress forcing in the X and Y directions and he assumed that the flow is horizontally non-divergent so DW DZ is zero so he was thinking about a specific way to look for uh, how the wind driven transport and circulation in the ocean should look like and then he simply took y derivative of this one and x derivative of this this one so you get dp dx dy dp dx dy which obviously will cancel when you subtract from each other and here you will get df dy v plus dv dy f df dy oops df ah uh, my computer df dy is of course the gradient of Coriolis in the meridional direction which we call the beta effect and similarly and you will get one over rho uh, del tau x del z del y and del tau y del z del x we'll get a curl out of that soon uh, and here you will get uh, dp dx dy as we said plus 
uh, you will get df dx times u and du dx times f. df dx is zero, of course, because the, the Coriolis doesn't vary in the zonal direction, in the x direction, it only varies in the y direction or the meridional direction. So when you subtract the equation, you will get terms dv d, uh, y plus du dx, which is, of course, zero. So when you do all that, uh, you will get an equation that uh, can be integrated from, uh, let's say, the bottom of uh, the Ekman layer where the wind forcing uh, doesn't uh, penetrate beyond which point. So without saying exactly how that is determined, we can just integrate uh, the equations in the vertical uh, from that depth of the Ekman layer to the surface where you get tau x and tau y. So when you integrate these equations in z, of course this goes uh, to tau x because at the bottom at z equal to let's say uh, z Ekman, uh, wind stress goes to zero. So you end up with uh, these simplified equations dp dx plus dp d uh, uh, dp dx is f times v plus tau x where v is of course the integrated meridional velocity or uh, the meridional transport and for the y direction you get dp dy equal to minus f times u where u again is the integral of u dz from the bottom of the Ekman layer to the surface and d tau y dz of course becomes tau y again similar to here okay um, now you can again uh, take, well, I should have mentioned that we integrate first beyond take, uh, be before taking uh, d dy and d dx, but it doesn't matter. So after integrating, you take uh, d dy of this, d dx of this, and subtract, and you remember dv dy plus du dx will go to zero, and df dx is zero. So you end up getting df dy times v, this term equal to del tau y del x minus del tau x del y which is just the curl of the wind stress so this is beta the gradient of Coriolis in the meridional direction uh, and that gives us beta times v which is the meridional transport uh, equal to curl of tau such a simple looking equation that Harold Spurdup derived in the 1940s and it was a remarkable find uh, at that time and he assumed that uh, for simplicity curl tau can be written simply as minus del tau x del y because he ignored del tau y del x uh, by looking at the wind stresses uh, because they are not only mostly zonal but the meridional gradient of the zonal wind stress is much larger than the zonal gradient of the meridional wind stress which is strong in some places but on average uh, it is very small when you let's say integrate across uh, a basin so the Swerdrup relation in this case looks very simple beta times v the meridional transport is given by minus del tau x del y so many such papers exist this is from uh, Tom Sack and Godfrey's book which is available for free online and they integrated this relation. Remember that this is a linear uh, first order equation, sorry, which means you can only impose one boundary condition. So you can uh, prescribe uh, the meridian, the stream function of the sort of flow to be uh, zero at the eastern boundary. Why can we compute stream function? Because uh, we have made the assumption that the flow is horizontally non-divergent, which always allows us to define stream functions. And remarkably, this simple re derivation that Harold Swerdrup did produces very realistic flow fields with the, uh, including the counter currents which go against the wind uh, and the so-called equatorial gyre or the subtropical uh, cell and the subtropical gyre which is the clockwise flow uh, with the northeasterly trades and the westerlies that we talked about. Of course it cannot close the western boundary solution and you can just assume that if you integrate from the eastern boundary to this region somewhere away from the western coast then that transport has to be 
going in the western boundary current which is one way of explaining why there is a very intense western boundary current whereas the eastern boundary current tends to be broad shallow and weak whereas the western boundary current tends to be uh, narrow strong and deep we'll come back and explain it in another way but uh, I hope it's very clear how we did uh, the spread of transport using the wind stress curl. Uh, to do the western boundary intensification we will need arguments about uh, vorticity conservation so we'll come back and define potential vorticity and how its conservation gives us uh, western boundary intensification. Okay. So let me stop it there and come back to uh, western boundary currents in the next podcast.